Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling General Linear Models Design of Experiments. And this is part two in a little mini series that I'm calling One Way Random Effects ANOVA. And here we're going to look at the distributional properties of the sum of squares. Now, as a reminder, the model that we're in is this case here. It's a one way uh, random effects. So there's only you know, effects associated with you know, one factor or one treatment. Um, the tiles are normally distributed, the epsilons are normally distributed, the tiles and epsilon are independent. And the goal that we want to test is, is are, are the variances associated with these um, levels zero or not? And so one piece that we have to do is we have to estimate the variance components to be able to test this. Now the sum of squares and really see one way fixed effects ANOVA because the derivations are 100% the same and I'm going to skip it in this video. But you can go here. So the sum of squares total is equal to the sum of squares treatment plus the sum of squares error. And then the matrix notation it can be this. IJ, remember J is the perpendicular projections on the column space of ones M is the perpendicular projection based on the column space of X. And then these, these partition the sum of squares total. Now for the distribution, I have a video called the distribution of quadratic forms and C theorem seven in this playlist, because that's what's going to be uh, uh, appropriate here. Now, actually, I have parts one, two, and three, so I don't, I don't remember if it's part one, two, or three, but it's theorem seven. And that really dealt with, we have a mean and we have a variance, a, a, you know, variance covariance matrix. And then to see the distribution of this, you know, you, have, you go to that theorem. So if we look at the distribution of one over sigma squared S, the, you know, the sum of squares for air, sometimes called sum of squares residual. So that's this plugging in the matrix form. And then one piece that we have to do is we have to show that this matrix and the variance covariance matrix is idempotent. So when you multiply them, this needs to be an idempotent matrix. So when you do this multiplication, we get the identity times this, so we just get it back. And then we get minus M times this, but M is... Uh, item potent, so you just get it back. So actually, those two just canceled out. Um, and then M, you know, I times that is I, and, and then minus M times this is, is minus M. And we get I minus M, which in previous videos we've shown that that is a perpendicular projection matrix, so it's item potent and symmetric. Now here's another way to think about this too. Now, M is a perpendicular projection matrix on the column space of X. I minus M is a perpendicular projection on the orthogonal complement space associated with the column space of M. So when you multiply this matrix and this matrix back, you get zero. So this whole matrix times this is zero. Boom. Instantly know that. Or you have to do the piecemeal like I did. Now, I minus M times I, you just get I minus M back. Now, the, since it's item potent, the rank associated with this is actually the trace. And so the trace of this is Na minus A. So this is the rank of this matrix. And that's actually something you have to know when you apply theorem 7. So then the distribution of this 1 over sigma squared sum of squared error is chi squared with this degrees of freedom, you know, the rank of this, the product of these matrices, and the non-centrality parameter is the mean of Y, which is this, and you have to transpose it, uh, times this matrix here, times the mean of Y. But notice that, that I minus M is a perpendicular projection matrix on the on orthogonal complement space associated with X, but the, the one vector is actually part of X. 
So when you take that vector times this perpendicular projection matrix, you get zero. So the non-centrality parameter uh, goes to zero. So this is a central chi-squared with Na minus A degrees of freedom. Now, the second page and, and the last, um, again, where I rewrote Y, it's, it's written, um, it's multivariate normal here. Now, notice in the previous uh, derivation, and, and actually this is pretty important, we worked with this, 1 over sigma times y, and then we got this. And it's the only way to make it work so this and this, that multiplication becomes idempotent. If you don't do this beforehand, then it becomes a little bit tougher to show that. But here, notice we're not you know, pre-multiplying that constant. So it's multivariate normal mu you know, in a one vector and then this variance covariance matrix. And now we want to show that the, the sum of squares treatment divided by sigma squared plus n times sigma tau squared. Um, oh, we're not showing that yet. We're going to find its distribution, but um, in matrix form, it's this. Sum of squares treatment is y squared, I mean, y transpose m minus j y. And see part one, uh, I mean, see the first mini-series, uh, one-way fixed effects and over for that derivation. Or, you know, we, we show it here, but we don't show the derivation. Um, okay, so now it's this. And, and we have to make reference to, to theorem seven in the video that I have, distribution of quadratic forms. So step one is we have to show that this times the variance covariance matrix is idempotent. So we take this matrix times this. Okay. Now, um, m minus j times m. Okay, so m times this, let's just do it piecemeal, keep the constant out front, that's what I do here, right? Then m times this, you get um, m back, and then j times that, you get j. So m minus j. So m minus j times m is m minus j. And then you this constant's out front. And then m minus j times i is m minus j. Now, we factor out that m minus j, which is what this is. So we're left with sigma squared and n sigma tau squared. Okay. Now, notice this cancels. So it leaves a 1. And we're left with m minus j, which m minus j is, is idempotent. It's a perpendicular projection matrix, actually. So the rank of this product, because it's idempotent, is the trace, and the trace of this is m minus 1. So that's what this is. So now, the according to theorem 7, this is a chi-squared with a minus 1, and the non-centrality parameter, the mean, um, times the uh, matrix, this, and so actually that is wrong because we should have it divided by that junk, so sigma squared plus n sigma tau squared. But leaving it off ended up not mattering, but technically it should be there, so that's a minus one or two if you're grading my homework here. But m minus j is a perpendicular projection matrix onto the orthogonal complement space of one with respect to m. So this one vector times that actually goes to zero. So this goes to zero. So it's a central chi-squared with a minus one degrees of freedom. Now, now note that if we were to, so this right here, so this is distributed 
as a central chi-squared with a minus one degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, what if we multiplied this to the other side? So actually to, to over here, and then we divided both sides times uh, sigma squared. It kind of puts us in this right here. So sigma squared, sum of squares treatment divided by sigma squared is actually distributed with this, this constant times this uh, uh, central chi-squared with a minus one degrees of freedom. Now, if the null hypothesis is true and that the sigma tau squared is, is zero, then this piece goes away and, and we're left with one. So this, under the null, is distributed with a central chi-square. But if the alternative is true, and that this is bigger than 1, then this number is bigger than 1, and it actually shoves that test statistic way into the right tail of that chi-square. And so we end up rejecting if this is big enough. And so anyway, so that's kind of the basis of the hypothesis test that we're going to look at in a later video, actually part five. Um, so now the expected value is the sum of squared error. And I have a video called the mean, the variance, covariance of quadratic forms, and we're going to use that exactly. So the expected value of the sum of squared error, and you write it in this quadratic form, then it becomes the trace of this matrix times the variance of y, and then it's plus the mean times this matrix, you know, times the mean. Well, the mean of y is mu 1, so this times that goes to 0. So this is 0. And then it becomes a trace of this. Now the variance was this. It's n sigma tau squared m plus sigma squared i. Now, this i minus m times m is 0, right? That projects onto the orthogonal complement, so that product is zero. So then we're left with this. So it's sigma squared i, i minus m, right? The whole thing's going over. And then the trace comes out front. Trace of i is n times a. Trace of m is a. So this is the expected value. So actually, so we can get an unbiased estimate if we were to just take the n minus a divided here. Then that is an unbiased estimate. Now the expected value of the sum of squares treatment, sum of squares treatment is this, so it's the same. We're using the same theorem. So it's the trace of this matrix times the variance associated with it, the mean times that matrix, the mean, and uh, this times one goes away, right? Because this projects on the orthogonal complement space of one, but stays in the comp space of x, but this is one. So then this trace, so, um, uh, m minus j times m, you get m minus j back. m minus j times i, you get m minus j. So then factor that out, and we're left with this constant and this constant times this. Now this is a constant, so we can bring it out, and the trace of this is a minus 1. And so this is it, so that's the expected value. Now, developing an unbiased estimate for sigma tau squared or sigma squared, that, that, that becomes a little bit trickier, which we will try to address in another video. Now, in here, I showed this proof right here for part two. And I think it's pretty common that we use theorem seven from the distribution of quadratic forms to prove it. And it actually becomes quite straightforward after that. Well, there's another proof to prove this that's not as straightforward, but I think will come in handy two reasons. One, in another little mini-series down the road, and two, I think it's just good for your mathematical tool bag to have another proof for the, the same thing. Okay, so that's all I have for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.